when we're talking about New York today, this is a national movement, you know, um, across 18 different states of leaders that are leading legislative campaigns in their respect. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'll play the video and then we'll come back and jump right into the conversation. In the meantime, uh, feel free to um, drop your name in the comments where you're, where you're, where you're tuning in from, you know, um, whatever state you're tuning in from. And if you have any uh, organizational um, affiliation, then also feel free to drop those in there as well. So with that, I'll ask folks to mute their mics and I'll play this short video. Yeah. My name is Johnny Perez, and I'm the director of U.S. Prison Programs for the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. For the past eight years, we've been building a movement to end solitary confinement that now includes 18 different state campaigns, all with the common goal of ending the torture of solitary confinement. Our allies include solitary survivors, faith leaders who are uniquely positioned to hold legislators accountable, and even student groups who will be taking on roles we hope to see culture change in. In September of 2020, NERCAD joined solitary survivors across 10 states to raise awareness about prison violence. Hey, Johnny, it's great to be a part of this. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Dolores Canales. I am a strong survivor of mass incarceration and of solitary confinement. I'm here today representing the Bail Project. Um, cash bail is one of the more hidden parts of systemic violence. And mind you, oftentimes people are held in solitary confinement in isolation pre-trial without being convicted of any charges whatsoever. Leave it to Johnny Perez, leave it to NERCAT to go all out, you know. <laughs> I've done IG Live before, but you go on nationwide with IG. And I just want to introduce my colleague and my partner, Jack Morris. Yes, uh, yes, bring on Jack. over 40 years Jack in prison Sarah. and over 30 years in solitary confinement, people. Did you all hear that? In California, over 30 years, not for discipline, but an assumption-based practice that California used for decades. Jack, do you want to say hi real quick and tell us about what you're doing? Hello. Uh, now I'm working with the reentry population. Uh, any of those, anybody coming uh, out of institutions, you can come to me and I will try to provide them with the necessary tools they need in order to remain free and, and avoid recidivizing. Thank you so much. I'm coming to you as a mom who was formerly incarcerated. I'm the coordinator for Massachusetts Against Solitary Confinement. And in Massachusetts, they've changed the name. So they claim they don't have solitary confinement, but you can't change the name and continue the torture. Well, hey guys, my name's Shemitria. I'm the community organizer at the Justice and Accountability Center. And I also am one of the people who hosts the Louisiana Stop Solitary Coalition. We had House Bill HB 344, which was a house, which was a bill that was gonna help women who were pregnant not to be able to have a pregnancy in prison. And so the beauty of that is we passed the bill this year. So right now in DOC, in the state of Louisiana, if you are a pregnant woman, you should not be having a birth, giving birth in solitary confinement or eight weeks after or before. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining in today. This is Pamela Wynn. I'm coming to you from Georgia. I am the founder of Restore Her, as Johnny said. We are the voice of incarcerated women in the South in Georgia, um, predominantly of pregnant women who are incarcerated. I myself was incarcerated for seven to eight months in federal prison. I was pregnant. I did serve approximately eight months in solitary confinement, but I'm happy to say that due to my work and due to my own lived experience, we were able to pass HB 345, which bans and outlaws any pregnant woman who is incarcerated in the state of Georgia to be placed in shackles and placed in solitary confinement. What's up from Connecticut? It's Raisha Bivens and Layton Johnson here. So our campaign and the focus of our bill, the PROTECT Act, is to eliminate the use of solitary confinement, period, in all Connecticut prisons. All right. Hi, everybody. From the heart of Texas, my name is Lauren Johnson. I'm a policy advocacy strategist with the ACLU of Texas, and I'm also a formerly incarcerated woman who gave birth to my first child and spent his first year of life incarcerated. Texas has an opportunity in the midst of all this tragedy of this moment and the pending budget crisis to be the state that we all deserve for it to be. A state where we invest in people and communities instead of the systems that destroy them. Only by leveraging the moral voice of faith leaders to hold legislators morally accountable and building the capacity of solitary survivors have we been able to get to the finish.
the last sentence there was supposed to say finish line. Um, and we can debrief about that later. Um, thank you for everybody who's joined us today. My name is Johnny Perez. I'm the director of US prison programs for the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. And uh, I work with faith leaders and solitary survivors uh, to push legislative change forward uh, through training, public education, um, and coalition work. Today, uh, we have uh, the New York Campaign Against Isolated Confinement, also known as the Halt Solitary Act uh, uh, campaign. And uh, they re uh, recently, we had a very big success in passing the Halt Solitary Confinement Act. And that was a nine year campaign. And it was a point where, you know, there, so, there were challenges along the way, a lot of lessons learned along the way. And uh, Nirkat thought it would be a good idea to bring, you know, the leaders and members of, uh, and members of, the, of the whole solitary campaign to discuss a number of things, you know, lessons learned, you know, what can, you know, uh, we learn from this campaign that maybe we can duplicate across other campaigns? What can, you know, um, foundations learn about, you know, uh, uh, the lessons learned within the journey and things of that nature? So I'm gonna create space to, for people to quickly introduce themselves. And then we're gonna jump into the conversation for about half an hour or so, and then we're gonna open it up for, uh, for, for audience questions. Does that make sense? Thank you so much. <laughs> so I'll start uh, uh, popcorn style. We'll start from Claire and then go to Victor. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Johnny. So great to be here today. I'm Claire DeRoche. I'm the social justice coordinator for the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock. We're located in Manhasset on Long Island, New York. Good afternoon. I'm Victor Pate, one of the organizers of the Hope Solitary Confinement Campaign, formerly incarcerated and healing survivor of solitary confinement. The others, uh, Jerome, Scott, and Milani. Yeah, uh, my name is Jerome Wright. I am a statewide organizer with the Campaign for Alternative Isolated Confinement, and I uh, located in buffalo new york uh, i am down in the city right now uh just having an interview with johnny yesterday but uh, i am directly impacted having spent seven and a half years of a 30-year sentence in solitary confinement hello my name is melania brown i am the sister of Leilene polanco my baby sister passed away on june 7th 2019 in solitary confinement she was placed there against medical staff advice um, and she suffered from epilepsy. She was supposed to never be in solitary confinement. Um, since her death, I took on um, the fight and I've been an activist. I joined Scott Found Me, the whole solitary com um, campaign found me. And I've been a part um, of this fight ever since. And I'm happy to be here. I'm Scott Paltrowitz, part of the Halt Solitary Campaign, and excited and honored to be here with so many awesome panelists and everybody in the audience. Nice, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for everyone introducing themselves. Uh, we're going to jump right into it, Victor. I'm going to come to you first. You know, um, you know, you, you know, you've, uh, you know, been in the campaign for, you know, as long as I can remember. You know, when I came home, you were one of the people that welcomed me home and actually gave me the courage to talk about solitary. And now we're finally here. So since we, you know, since this is about lessons learned in the campaign, let's just ground the conversation and 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 you know the bill. What exactly you know the bill actually changed and, and the specific uh, key pieces, uh, uh, specific provisions of the bill for uh, for folks to know. Thanks. Thank you so much, Johnny. That's a good question, and uh, thank you to Narcat. Uh, for hosting this here and shout out to all of my colleagues at NARCAT um, and also glad to be here amongst my colleagues uh, with the whole solitary confinement campaign in this space and time. So I will, I guess, kind of um, as succinctly as I possibly can go over some of the key components of the whole solitary confinement act and what it will do. Well, first and foremost, it places a limitation on the amount of time that people can spend in segregated confinement units or special housing units, so 15 days. In addition, it creates residential rehabilitative units that will afford incarcerated individuals, more out of cell programming and trauma-informed care to address underlying actions or that resulting in them uh, winding up in segregated housing units. It also creates therapeutic, programmatic, meaningful 
programs as well as more out of cell and recreational time. It also places a restriction of placement of youth, pregnant women, elderly, and individuals with a serious mental illness into any type of segregated housing environment. It additionally increases training for staff who will and might be assigned to the special housing units once HALT has been fully implemented. And here's a really big one for me, which of up until this particular time or up until the time the HALT will actually be implemented, it creates access to legal representation during the disciplinary process, which normally has not been the case for anyone that was facing uh, disciplinary hearings and or facing any type of time in special housing units. And that's a really big um, addition to the components of the whole Solitary Confinement Act. And I think this actually is a real big uh, piece uh, when people have to sit before uh, administration and deal with uh, a lot of times bogus, trumped up, minuscule charges that oftentimes because of lack of representation, they wound up in segregated housing, keep lock, shoe, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I don't want to be long-winded because um, I know we kind of agree to that we'd be as soon as possible and also give a uh, platform for my other kind. So that's basically the overall core mechanisms of the Holt Solitary Confinement Act. And I'm quite sure my colleagues will go into a little bit more in-depth um, detail with regards to the other components of Holt and how it actually works. Absolutely, and, and in fact, I'm gonna I'm go, I'm go to Scott and talk about language. You know, there's this a, a piece you know that's very important that was special for me, and that it addresses you know um, sp uh, spaces where people are held for 14 hours or more. You know, and we know that you know a while back, you know, Night Crew found that that uh, Corrections was actually holding more people in Key Block and saying that they were not holding people in solitary. So the bill language is really strong. So Scott, I want to come to you right and talk about the importance of bill language. In the final moments of the bill, there were a lot of negotiations with stakeholders. So I guess I want to get you to talk a little bit about how important is it to have strong bill language to leverage the inevitable concessions that are going to happen later, you know, and then and, and when drafting bill language, you know, what are some of the best practices that maybe organizers look to and then can kind of adapt, you know, from your from your view and experience. Thanks, Johnny. Great question. Um, a few things to say. First of all, I would say if you're working on introducing legislation and drafting legislation, uh, go for what you want to see. You know, don't go for what you think is possible or feasible. Go for what you actually believe is right and what you want to see. Um, and in the case of HALT, you know, we, this is now back in 2012, 2013, as a coalition, uh, including people who came home from solitary, people who had loved ones inside, People inside at the time, as well as faith leaders and lawyers and others, all collectively together drafted the language of HALT. And so I think that's important too, as another lesson is to bring everybody together, particularly following you know, the lead of people who've lived through this experience, because they'll know the details of what's, what is needed in a bill such as this. Um, but definitely go for what you want. You know, um, to your point, Johnny, about concessions, you know, we are grateful and thankful that in the at the end of the day, we actually got 99.9% .9 of what we were pushing for. We were expecting, you know, to, to, to be ready for whatever came, but that we weren't going to give up anything, you know, we were going to fight because we knew already, to be honest, although back in 2012, 2013, this is what we wanted to see. Uh, I think the the winds and the world have changed, and we know that at this stage, HALT is really like a compromise bill. You know, it follows the UN standard of 15 consecutive days, but we believe that it's now time to abolish solitary entirely. And so we weren't really ready or willing to concede anything, and thankfully the campaign stayed strong following, you know, the decisions made by other people on this on this Zoom call. And we stayed strong and we were able to, to hold strong and get done what we needed to get done. 
Nice and great work, great work, great, great work. I, I, I was on I was on a Zoom call. Literally cried when I got the news. I was on a Zoom call with our friends in Connecticut. Uh, Ali Perry there was talking and literally said, "What's wrong?" I'm like, "The whole bill passed," <laughs> you know, because um, a lot of hard work has gone into it, um, and every it's it's all the straws put together that broke the camel's back, you know. Uh, which brings me to to Claire, right? You know, this conversation around faith, and you know, faith leaders, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of the video. You know, uniquely positioned to hold our legislators accountable, you know, to the values that they say they stand for. Um, and Claire, you two have been, you know, the campaign for a long time and organizing faith leaders from faith lobby days, you know, up in Albany to local rallies, you know, um, over, uh, you know, uh, in Long Island. So I guess, you know, if I can get you to talk a little bit about the importance of having, you know, the faith community engaged. Um, uh, or let me ask you another way. Can you share the unique value? which faith leaders and, and faith communities bring to campaigns like the whole solitary campaign. And then I have a follow-up question uh, after that. Thanks. Sure, Johnny, thank you very much. I'll be happy to talk about that from my own experience. Um, and first I wanna say it's so great to be here with my HALT friends and fellow advocates. Uh, being part of this campaign has been one of the best experiences of my life. So if you can get involved in a campaign, do it. Um, you know, during the pandemic, we've heard a lot of people talk about the need for trusted messengers, trusted messengers to pass the word about the precautions we must take to protect our own health and the health of others. Well, I think when it comes to promoting justice, faith leaders and communities of faith are those trusted messengers. Leaders, no matter the denomination or faith persuasion, who believe in the liberating power of love, who believe that each person is infinitely more than their worst act, can help others understand that love requires action. As I said earlier, I work for a Unitarian Universalist congregation. We became involved with the Campaign for Alternatives to Isolated Confinement because of a question posed by one of our members. She asked me, Claire, do you know that people with mental illness are put in solitary confinement? I was embarrassed to say, no, I didn't know that but that I would do some research and get back to her. This led us to NearCat and their prison program and ultimately to the HALT campaign. And I wanna say that we actually stumbled into the campaign when it was just beginning. Mm -hmm. So we were fortunate to have the experience right from the beginning to learn about solitary, to learn about the horror of the torture of solitary, and to work with so many other great people. And we finally passed the bill. Yeah. So I think with um, faith communities, from my experience, the first thing we did was begin to educate our own congregation. And uh, some of the people here on this panel today are people who came out to Long Island to talk with us. Um, then we went to other congregations to um, share what we had learned. And what I found is that once people learn that solitary confinement beyond 15 days is torture, they become involved. They know that their faith compels them to act. I think something else unique about faith communities being involved in long-term campaigns like this mm -hmm. is that we know the value of perseverance. While our spirits may be brought low by delays and setbacks, the community bonds that we have keep us involved. I found that having a consistent, meaningful, communal, spiritual practice is important. In 2015 at Shelter Rock, we began the practice of holding a candlelight vigil on the 23rd of every month to remember those who spend 23 to 24 hours a day 
in solitary confinement. We use readings and reflections written by those in solitary, and we read 23 names, lighting a candle for each person. We decide on a specific action for the month and then end by renewing our commitment to end long-term solitary confinement. This practice renews our spirits and we hope that when we write to those who are behind the walls and share this with them, they too know a moment of consolation. So in answer to your question, Johnny, that's a little bit of what I think the faith community can offer to a campaign like the HALT campaign. I, 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 as you were talking, I was thinking about the candlelight vigils that we've done right in the center of the Capitol and how powerful that was. And then I think about my own experience, you know, um, having done lobby visits uh, with and without faith leaders. And I can tell you that legislators do talk to you a little bit different when you have <laughs> a person of the call sitting right next to you, <laughs> you know? Um, so although it's hard to quantify, um, uh, it's, it's really critical that faith leaders are involved in legislative campaigns. Uh, because yes, you, you can hold legislators accountable differently than, than other communities can. And I think that when we put all of these pieces together, that's ultimately what gets us to the finish line. You know, and this brings me to Melania. And Melania, you've been, you know, a powerful voice of the campaign, um, you know, uh, uh, a powerful leader in organizing family members also who have been harmed by the system. And I guess, you know, from your experience in engaging with the whole solitary campaign, what is some advice that you can share with family members um, about using their voice in order to push legislative change forward? I believe it's very important for the families to get involved because um, with the one thing about this government that I've noticed throughout my fight is that when the family is silent, they don't do nothing. They'll push it under the rug. I think it's very important for families um, to get involved, to show up, to show their face, to show them you know, use that pain and, and share it with them. Like, let them know they hurt you. It's very important because, you know, our loved ones, they need us. And if we're not fighting for them, then who's not going to fight for them? Um, when my sister passed away, I grabbed a mic three days after her death, three days after her death, completely broken. I've never done this before. I, I didn't even walk across the stage to receive my own diploma because just being in front of a mass group of people watching me used to give me anxiety. It used to just, it wasn't my thing, but I knew I had to do it. I knew my sister needed it. I knew I had to be my sister's voice. So that's one thing I, you know, that's my advice that I could give to family members. You have to be your loved one's voice because they can't talk anymore. So now you're doing the talking for them. And this government, if you don't show your face for your loved ones, they will sweep it under the rug. It will go unnoticed. If I, I believe a hundred percent that if I didn't do what I did, my sister had one of the fastest settlements that, America had for an incarcerated person. It was it was a, not even a year. It, it got solved so, so fast. Why? That's because of the pressure that I was putting on them. That's because of, you know, the, throughout my process, I met other organizers. I met Holt Salutary. I met, you know, people throughout the process and, and I showed up. Even if it made no sense for me to show up, even if it wasn't about my sister and I showed up, it does, I show up. Whenever I can show up, I show up. You have to be your family member's voice. You have to, you have to. Like, I believe that if I didn't do what I did for my sister, right now, I, I, my sister, I still probably would have never found out what happened to her. Uh, the lawsuit would have still been in, 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 in process. They, would have, they would, have, would have been giving us issues. But being that I was out there fighting for her and I showed them that I wasn't gonna, they wasn't gonna silence me, it was easier for them, so they thought, to get rid of me than to have to deal with the public pressure. It was easier for them and you know, little did they know that that wasn't gonna stop me. So it's very important for family members to get involved, like, absolutely very important. Um, That's the number one, I mean, if you're not fighting, like. I said, if you're not fighting for your own family, you know, the government will look at it like, well, she's not, they're not even fighting for their own loved ones. So they sweep it right under the rug. So it's very important to get out there and fight and for your voice to be heard. You're on mute, Johnny. You're on mute. <laughs> 
sorry, I tend to space out too when I talk and I, I didn't notice, but I was, I was, I was, I was identifying with, with, with your experience in the sense that, you know, as a person who's experienced solitary confinement, there's sometimes, and, 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 and other folks who've experienced solitary confinement told me this too, that sometimes it does get a little bit emotionally exhausting to, you know, to, to go out there and put the boots back on and, you know, strap up and get back out there, but it's, it's so necessary. And, you know, I guess, I guess I'll ask you a follow-up question as far as it's, it's obvious that, you know, making sure that your sister gets justice, you know, keeps you, keeps you motivated, uh, you know, it, to keep coming back to the fight, you know, year after year and, and month after month, day after day, you know, what, what advice can you give folks, you know, um, especially family members who are also dealing with the pain of having their loved one impacted and then also, you know, um, engaging in this work, you know, as far as, you know, keep coming back if that makes sense. Um, well, it's no secret that it's very hard. It's very hard to go out there and say, you 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 know, repeat. It's like you relive it over and over again. Every time you go out there and you fight for your loved ones, it's like you're reliving it like if it was just yesterday that it happened. Um, my advice is, you have you have to be strong you have to find strength within i'm not saying that i'm the strongest person although people view me that way you know i'm not the strongest person every time i leave a rally or i leave you know a, a press conference or anything that has to do with justice for my sister and justice for you know every other individual that's going through what my sister went through i go home empty i go home and I break down. Sometimes I don't even make it out of my car. I cry. Um, and, you know, some, some days I'm down for three days. But I get myself back up. I get myself back up because there's no, there's no love without action. Action, love, you have, to, you have to show your love. It's not just saying I love someone. Love is an action. If you're not doing what you need to do for that loved one, for your, your, your loved ones, you know, that's, how can you say that's love? You know, it, it's painful, but you have to just, what keeps me going is just knowing what they did to my sister and knowing that I love my sister to death. And, and, and I, and I was not no way, excuse me, Ma here, pick this up. There was no way that I was going to let my sister, it's the cable. I'm sorry, guys. There's no way that I was going to let my sister's name go in vain. There was absolutely no way that I was going to allow that. I knew my sister needed justice. I knew I needed to fight for it. I knew no one was going to go out there and fight for it, for, you know, for me. I mean, yeah, people go out and they do their, they organize things and they, you know, but I knew I had to take on that fight. So you just have to, you know, get yourself up and, and just keep going. Take one day at a time. Sometimes if you need a break, you take a break. I, I, you know, at first I didn't know how to take breaks. So I was having like mental breakdowns after mental breakdowns, you know, sometimes it gets like that. You're so angry inside and you want justice so bad that you forget about yourself. You push yourself to the side and, you know, and, and, and yeah, that, that can affect you. But if you have to take care of yourself, you yourself if you don't take care of yourself there's no way that you could go out there and fight for the world there's no way that you could go out there and fight for your loved ones take your breaks when needed but always come back always get up and come back you the thing with this government is i you know i I, I built so much anger for them that I wasn't even able to grieve properly. I haven't even grieved my sister properly, to be honest. But going out there when I fight, that helps me. That motivates me. It pushes me. I took my anger and I turned it into a purpose. I was not going to sit home and just cry. I was not going to stay home and be depressed. I was not just going to let her fade away and go in vain. I just kept going and going and going. You just have to take care of you, yes, but you just have to get up and keep on pushing and the fight is hard it is hard i'm not saying it's easy it's easy. hard although you know the whole solitary team we make it look easy but it's not easy it's hard it takes <laughs> a toll on us yeah. you know it takes a, it takes a toll on us you know we have our own families we have our own kids we have you know but we have to you know not just for our loved ones we have for us the the ones that have children already like me i want to make sure that this world that I could play my part to ensure that this world is the safest that it can be for when my children go out there and they're by themselves. And, you know, you just gotta, you just gotta keep going. We're humans yeah. and, 
you have to you have to be there for for others and you show love through action and you just got to keep pushing you get up and go again thank you for the reminder about self-care you know as questions come up in two other meetings earlier this week you know get a sense of how people take care of themselves doing this work and you know you're talking about you know showing up for family members um during the campaign jerome and i'm coming to you next jerome you know um as a statewide organizer you've 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 organized countless rallies and marches, you know, et cetera, doing, doing this work. And you've also been reincarcerated as a result of your work with the whole solitary campaign, which sometimes people from the outside looking in don't, 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 don't get that as far as from, from the organizing point of view that, you know, being on parole, you know, um, you know, being, you know, on this invisible leash, you know, by the, by the government and doing this advocacy work, how you can be reincarcerated and you were, you were one of those people who are reincarcerated because of your leadership and involvement with the campaign. And the question I have for you is like, what, what can allies learn from your experience in terms of supporting campaign members uh, who have uh, records and are also, you know, uh, campaign organizers? Yeah, thank you, Johnny, and thanks, thanks for the question. I, before I start, I just want to give a big shout out to NARCAT in particular, uh, to have a national organization. We're talking about faith leaders and to have a national religious organization that, you know, encompasses a goal of ending torture is, is really big because that is a the moral compass that I think our faith leaders bring to any fight. And so I really appreciate that NARCAT is the forefront of that. Um, Advice, <laughs> you know, that there, there, there were times when uh, I thought that uh, there is no advice you give anybody. If, if you're in this because you know it's the right thing to do, there are sacrifices that you have to make. Um, did, I, did I want to go back to prison? No. Did I know that that was a possibility? Yeah. As a first thing, I would say the organizers, the people in this fight who have records on parole or have a situation where they can be reincarcerated, that it's very real. And, and their goal is to do that, to stop you and others from stepping into your shoes. I mean, I was bluntly told that, see who else is going to take your place now. Like mm -hmm. the goal was to, you know, uh, really scare people away from stepping up because they felt like they would, they would suffer the same thing. Uh, I think my faith, and that's why I, I shout out knock at my faith is what kept me during that time and my family and people on this call who were, who came out and rallied in the cold and the rain with signs saying free Jerome marching in front of parole. Uh, it was that's why I love this campaign so much is that we were fighting battles on multiple fronts, but we were always fighting for each other and for our people. And I think when you fight for each other and you fight for your people, whatever the sacrifices is, you need to make them. Because like Melania said, we want to leave a world for our children that's better than the one that we now inhabit. And in order to do that, we got to do what some of our ancestors that have gone on before us did. And that stand up in the face of tyranny and power and oppression and racism and speak truth to it, regardless of the consequences, knowing that you're doing the right thing. And I believe whenever you do right, right comes out of it because I was doing the right thing. And although I suffered nine months of incarceration, uh, I was totally exonerated in the end. Uh, and I had so much support that now they kind of leave me alone, which has been a benefit of that. So I think it's really important that if you're standing with somebody that you stand with them all the way through the script. And that's what they did in this campaign, no matter what went on, even if I had been guilty, they were standing with me because they believed in me and what we were fighting for and that we were all in this together. And uh, these young kids have a saying and, and, and I've incorporated with what we do. Really, we all we got mm -hmm. it's us against them. And when we stand together and we write, we win. Nice. Thank you for that, Jerome. There's, you know, there's, you know, our lives just have so many layers, especially when you've been involved with the system and doing this work. And it's always supportive to have a campaign that truly understands all of, the, all of those layers and that we're multi-dimensional people, more importantly, how the systems truly do impact us. So, you know, sorry that you had to go away for another nine months on top of the 30 you already did, you know, um, but also glad that, you know, you, you're, you're here to tell about it, but folks can also learn from that experience about how to really show up for, you know, uh, organizers who are also directly impacted. Now, I'll say something about the whole solitary campaign. I really appreciate you know, brings me into this next question before we take some some questions from the audience in a few minutes. Is that um, the whole solitary campaign for is a leader in, in your honorarium structure. One of the things that 
you know, we pride ourselves at NERCAT is that we really support, you know, um, making sure that we compensate folks who are directly impacted, who are not otherwise already being paid as a result of doing this work. Um, and while, you know, um, you know, and while, you know, um, there are times when people with direct experience only get paid for sharing their stories, the whole campaign has led in the sense that we also provide a risk for people outside of that, for not just providing stories, but other types of support with the campaign. So I guess, uh, and a question I kind of throw to anyone, you know, um, is, is, you know, um, I did write it down. Uh, yeah, how, yeah how, how and why did the campaign arrive at that decision, right? Um, and then how did it impact, you know, the campaign membership? And I think that's important for other folks, you know, and other campaigns um, to, to, to kind of get some thinking around that. I, I know I was just wrong, but I, I have to say this because we talked Please. about how the, I was supported. Um, on the record, I will say for that nine months, I was suspended from work with pay. Wow. Can I say that again? I was suspended with pay because of their belief in me and because of the fight that we had, because of the support that we give each other. Mm -hmm. I, me, my family was allowed to not lose our financial security during the entirety of that incarceration. And that is unheard of. That is God working. That is love in action. And that's what we do for each other. And I just add a little bit to that, uh, what Jerome said. So, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, because that we realize in the reality of it all that no, no matter amount of uh, monetary compensation can ever compare to the trauma and the collateral damages that we uh, directly impacted can even equate with. But I think that one of the things that we thought about early on in terms of support, because uh, when you're asking people to come to meetings, to come to rallies, to go to Albany, to speak, you know, a lot of time, a lot of people that have been a part of this campaign, especially those who've been the director, a lot of them were actually homeless, had no regular income or had very little income. And for the most part, depending on their families to help them make it through the day. So we had to think and, and, and put this in, into a factor, not you know, also considering, you know, uh, having uh, being given grants to do different things to grow the campaign and for us to be effective in the advocacy work. We knew that it would, you know, not only help individuals, but it would also help campaign because we need people to show up at a certain place at a certain time. How are they going to get there? And then how are they going to get back? How are they going to feed themselves or how are they going to get fed? So I think that, you know, the, the humanitarian part about the campaign is that we always looked at supporting the people who supported us, and especially those of us who've been directly impacted um, through, through the uh, carceral system, that this was important. It was not the reason why people came, but I think that it was the least that we could do to at least let them know we appreciate you, and at least for the time that you was able to share, that was very critical in a lot of points to people, we were willing to compensate you. And I'm just gonna add to this one part, that before I even got hired, I think I did this work for about maybe 15 to all close to 20 years before I even got paid. And I did. Wait, that wasn't all with the campaign, right? For the record. <laughs> did it get? No, so no. That wasn't all with the campaign. <laughs> no, no. I'm just yeah. saying that, you know, no, no. But I'm just saying, you. just doing the advocacy work and yeah. the volunteer work. I think I did it about 15 years, and I was part of mostly every campaign in New York State. I don't remember which one I wasn't a part of. Still are. But I, <laughs> yeah, but I'm just saying is that I did it because I cared because of what happened to me, the collateral damage, and, and because I knew what happened to me was still happening other than I wanted to ensure that I had had a place and a part in the trying to change this system. So for me, you know, I was definitely grateful that, you know what I'm saying, the, that eventually I was able to uh, be hired to do this work. But I think that, you know, for the most part, you'll find that most of the people that have been with us from beginning and whatever point that they came in, got into it because they cared about the issues and how it was affecting people's lives. But I'm so glad that we were able to give compensation. I think that had a great input and impact on what we were able to do. Yeah. Um, you know, Johnny, I, 
Could I add something to that, please? Please, please do, yes. I'd just like to go back one step before what uh, Victor just said, because I remember very clearly in the beginning, being at a meeting in the conference room at the Correctional Association, and there's a group of us sitting around the table. Most of us are white. Most of us were not directly affected. And we looked at one another and we said, how can we get directly affected people to be here? Because that was our goal. And the first thing we realized is we had to take away the obstacles that were keeping them from, for, from participating. And one thing was um, bus tokens, bus cards. The next thing was offering honorariums when they spoke. And then finally to paying directly affected people who would be our organizers and leaders. Yeah. So that is part of our history. And I'm, I'm just so glad that we, we figured that out. <laughs> yeah, no, and that's, and, and very proud of that. Cause I think it, it it, you know, it, 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 it does set a model and a precedent. Um, although, you know, this, of course, there's campaigns that are also doing that work, but, you know, it's important for me, I think that to, to really, you know, to really convey the foundations, the importance of it. You know, when we're fundraising, this, this work doesn't get done for free, although there's a lot of blood, sweat and tears that goes into it, but really getting foundations to understand, you know, that these are multi-year campuses and how can we really support you know, the people on the ground, uh, which, you know, are everyone on this call and, and those who are not on this call as well. You know, so I guess I want to pose a question to all of you while I ask people who are in, in, in the audience to start dropping their questions in the comments there. Um, what can foundations, you know, learn from, you know, a, a, you know, eight, nine year campaign in New York City, you know, and as a follow up, you know, how can they grant in a way in which would allow the campaign to be as effective as possible? So just kind of want to hear some of that feedback, um, you know, from, 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 from any of you. Oh, oh, Jerome, oh. You, you didn't fall for it this okay. time. Okay. You didn't fall for it, oh, Jerome. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so uh, I guess. <laughs> got yeah, a little quiet. The only public No, no. I was waiting part. for Jerome. You know, I always wait for Jerome. He didn't fall yeah. for it this time. So I, and I'll be really quick. So for me, I guess that, and, and I'm going to say this here because I think that it's just so important that you know what I'm saying we conceptualize this here. And especially when we're talking about uh, campaigns and advocacy work and legislative, you know what I'm saying, lobbying, et cetera, et cetera. There should never be anything about us without us. And I say that because <clears throat> Those of us who have been through the grinder, who have have direct firsthand experience, we are the ones, absent PhDs and <clears throat> DDDs and whatever alphabet you put behind your name, no one could ever equate with the experiences that, that we have experienced. And I think that it's a different, it's a different um, mindset. Uh, in terms of uh, how we approach the work, but more importantly, what's the important components that go into this work? What should be talked about? What should be addressed on uh, how we should strategize in doing this here? I think that it's just so important that, you know, that we are always at the table when you're talking policies and change and legislation and laws and anything that has to do with anything that affects our lives. And I think that when you're talking about foundations, you should make sure that there are um, directly impacted people in leadership and decision making positions. I think that's so important. I think that that uh, is a core component and drive of the work that foundations do, uh, corporations do, uh, whatever may have you that comes up with, you know what I'm saying, uh, directions of campaign and how the work should be done. And by by no means am I am I taking away from the work or the, the commitment or the dedication for people who may not have been directly impacted because that's not my intention. But I just want to make the point that it's just so important that there should be nothing about us without us. Thank you for that. 
Jerome? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I would. I, it's very hard to add to that, really, because that is the nexus to this whole discussion. That um, I, this campaign had leadership from uh, people like myself and Vic and, and Anissa and a bunch of directly impacted people. Melania with a indirectly, directly impacted because of family member and. Foundations need to know that we have the wherewithal and the ability to do that beyond just our testimonies, that we have the we have the aptitude to lead, that many of us have been leading in areas of this nature without the compensation financially, without the titles behind our names in front or the letters behind, that uh that we have the expertise, not just in criminal justice matters, but in the ability to motivate people to do things and to even to learn how to do the things that we don't already know how to do and that they should embrace when directly impacted people or people without foundation or histories and legacies where we apply for stuff that we get it. And also that the, that you don't constrain us to these one-time grants, you know, these many things. That, so we get the ball rolling, we got a good full steam ahead, then the money runs out and you have to do all this. This should be, if you believe in us and what we're doing, there should be multi-year grants so that we can do. You don't put somebody in office for six months and expect them to change the world. You give them some time. So if you want us to get the things done that you say you believe in, that you're willing to fund, Give us the money and the opportunity to do it. Good. I'm gonna um, thank you for that. I'll I'll, I'll, I'll echo that uh, really quickly in the sense that we, you know, foundations do need to understand that campaigns are multi-year campaigns, and maybe maybe the whole solitary campaign could have did it in three instead of nine. Folks would have came on board a little bit sooner. But more importantly, understanding the importance of you know conditions work and how that's tied to every other work. So if you fund reentry, you should also be funding conditions because they're not inseparable. You know, so deepening your own understanding about the issues and how they're all connected and how these dominoes, um, how one inf impacts and affects the other. Uh, I see um, a question in the comments and we'll close it off with that one, but I, I, I wanna make sure that we do talk about the recent BOC um, voting rule uh, uh, to um, on the service says to end solitary and replace it with these new alternative models called the Risk Management Accountability System or RMAS units. You know, um, so I want to go to Scott and ask, ask others to, 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 to chime in. But, you know, Scott, can you can you talk about how these units actually do not end a solitary confinement? And then how can the folks, you know, support the campaign moving forward? Because, yes, we pass on the state level, but the fight does continue in the city. Thanks, Johnny. Great question. Yeah, some of you may have seen national news. Mayor de Blasio was on CNN yesterday. Um, you know, a lot of touting of this as New York City ending solitary confinement. The problem is what they're replacing solitary confinement with is solitary confinement. And they're just calling it something else. You know, they're keeping people locked up 23 hours a day in a cell alone and they're calling it solitary confinement. Now, what they're saying, they're saying people have out of cell time, but that out of cell time is leaving the cell where somebody sleeps and going through a door to be just next to the same cell in a smaller cell all by themselves. And that's their out of cell time. So it's just smoke and mirrors. Um, you know, it's what we've seen for decades with how departments of corrections try to manipulate language, but it's, you know, even more preposterous that the mayor of the city who promised you know, after Leilene died and really invoking Leilene's name and Khalif Browder's name, uh, you know, it's really disgusting that the city would try to say that they're ending solitary when they're not. And we're going to hold their feet to the fire. Um, and as the campaign, you know, first of all, the halt solitary bill applies to jails as well as prisons. And this new model violates halt. So we're going to have to make sure that they at the very least comply with halt. But more than that, we're going to be pushing for the city council in New York to, to pass legislation to fully abolish solitary confinement in a real way where people have out of cell time full days, 14 hours out of cell per day in congregate spaces with other people and with programming where they interact, you know, with other people in regular, you know, spaces. So that's what we're going to be doing, you know, stay tuned for how to get directly engaged with that push for city council. But this is really important, not just for folks in New York, but 
uh, for the whole state and for the whole country. Because if this is what ending solitary confinement means, then that's a really dangerous precedent to be setting. And so we all need to come together to demand that let's actually end solitary and truly end solitary and do what we know works to, to reduce violence and improve safety, which is you know not restrict out of cell time, but expand out of cell time, do more engagement, more programming that's been proven you know, to be effective. So that's what we're gonna be pushing and hope to partner with everybody here. Nice, Scott, nice, nice. The fight does, the fight does continue, right? It's like, you know, at the end of one chapter it usually starts another, especially when you're working to dismantle a system that's intentionally created, like Jerome said yesterday, it was designed uh, uh, this way, uh, uh, multiple ways it's been designed this way. I see here we have nine minutes left. There was a question in the comments, which I'm going to copy and paste again. It's a question about counsel. I'm not sure if you, if if the, if I if I accurately understand the question, but I'm going to kick it actually to Scott, um, and I'll repost it here. It's this question around um, uh, how can how can we create a mandate to counsel and treat uh, torture victims uh, like uh, uh, my brother Sean. Uh, special kind of trouble, just I guess counsel, ensuring that torture victims get um, right to counsel, ensuring that they get representation to that degree. Thanks, Johnny, and thanks, Heather. And let me first just say that Sean has been an active part of this campaign from behind the walls, and so has his mom been an active uh, participant in this campaign and really uh, was instrumental really to getting this bill passed. So I wanna thank you and your family and please know that we all keep Sean in our thoughts and prayers all the time and are looking forward to him getting some support. And you know, I read your question about counsel, not to be about legal counsel, but to be about you know, therapeutic counsel support, et cetera. And you know, I, the, the first thing to say is that hopefully you know, the Department of Corrections now has to implement HALT. And so starting uh, you know, by March 31st of 2022, this you know, next March, they have to fully implement the bill, which means anybody like Sean should be in general population, um, unless there's some reason that something happens between now and then that would require Sean to you know, spend at most 15 days. Um, um, in solitary and then go to an alternative unit where he would have at least seven hours out of cell per day and have access to programming with other people. Mm -hmm. So he should be getting that. And although March 31st is the, the deadline for full implementation, they have to start doing this work now. And so for somebody like Sean, who's been in solitary for 27 years, they better move him to a step down program, you know, as soon as possible, make sure that he's actually getting some support that's needed. But you know, that's just with this legislation and we know that that's not enough, to be honest. You know, I, I honestly can't imagine, and maybe I'll kick it to others to talk more about this, but I can't imagine what 27 years in solitary is or means or how you, you know, make your way back even into a prison population, let alone hopefully Sean will come home and, you know, how he makes it back home. Um, but we definitely need to be continuing to work through HALT, but beyond HALT to make sure that people who've come home over the last several years and decades, you know, get support that they need to adjust properly um, and to be successful and thrive, not just adjust, sorry, that's not even a good word, but to thrive and to be the people that they, they can be. Yeah, I, I you know, um, first of all, I just want to say that Heather, thank you. Your brother has been an inspiration definitely to this campaign. Uh, I got to had the pleasure and the privilege of reading a poem that he wrote that brought many members to tears out there the day that we read it. So um, know that we are still fighting for. I, I, all I can say is the system has no uh, good faith interest in doing the right thing when it comes to solitary or anything else, rehabilitation, any of that. And it's up to us, people like myself and all of you who tune in today to hold them accountable because it won't change. I think Melania said it best. I, no, Melania said it good, but uh, Frederick Douglass said it best, that power can seize nothing without a demand. And until we continue to demand that they act the way we need them to act, they're not going to change. So we need everybody to continue helping us to push the envelope with them to do the right thing, because on their own, they have no desire to do it. They have no ability to do it on their own. We, they have to be forced. And 
I think that's what this this conversation is about. That those of you who are listening and watching and share, I'm going to share this with your friends and get involved and help us hold them accountable. We're going to do it with or without you. But with you, we will be much more stronger, much more able to accomplish that goal. And that's what we need. We need to be all in this together. Thank you for that, Victor. And also thank you for the question. I actually didn't see your, your name on, on my side. Uh, you know, I was talking to but echoing, you know, um, uh, 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 my colleagues here. You know, there's, before I close this out, I do want to get a quick, re, um, just a last minute thought, but I want to respond to this question directly. Um, you know, uh, is there a group of tor is there a group of solitary torture survivors like there is for political prisoners? And I'll tell you, you know, that, that allows me to talk about the work that NearCat is doing. And uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're putting together a solitary survivor network, you know, for folks who've experienced solitary survivor, uh, solitary across the country to be able to come together um, in community, you know, and either work on legislation to work, you know, work together on uh, a, a number of things, either in coalition, uh, mentorship components, you know, we talk, you know, some, sometimes people with direct experience and especially solitary survivors say we, like you don't have to come home to be an advocate, you know, um, there's also people come home and be electricians and they're fitness folks and there's all, like, you know, the full spectrum of, of what a person can live and we want to be able to build community for these folks with the common denominator that yes, we've all experienced solitary confinement. Um, so definitely stay, stay tuned for that. Um, we have three minutes left, uh, so maybe in, in less than a minute or so, I want to go just go around and just share some last minute, you know, um, thoughts, you know, you know, uh, last thoughts, you know, um, and then I'll, uh, we'll close this out and uh, a sincere and deep thank you to everybody who's tuned in and also to all the panelists for all your hard work throughout the years and we got rallies coming up and meetings to do this is not over, um, but just like a deep and sincere thank you, um, especially for those who've been doing this work when when I was still in solitary, how's that? <laughs> you know, um, so let's go around for just a quick last minute thought and we'll close this out. Um, and then I'll ask folks to join us um, uh, uh, in our next segment, thanks. Yeah, I'll ask people to look in the chat. Uh, Victor put it in and I was gonna bring it up. There is a group called Survivors of the Systems that meet on Wednesday, on Thursdays and Saturday mornings. Mm -hmm. And uh, although everybody in there is not a survivor of solitary, they're all survivor of that system, which is basically a big solitary confinement in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So if anybody on here has family members or friends or people that need help to bond with people who've had shared experiences, lived experience as far as prison and solitary, please implore them to join the SOS group. You can find that on most of your platforms as we have Instagram, Facebook and all that. So, Join us, send, send some people over and we can help them as we counsel ourselves. And I, it's very important that we get that opportunity to help each other, so yeah. Maybe as we close out, if somebody can find the link and drop it in the comments for the benefit of the panelists or send it to me and I'll make sure that I send it around. But um, yeah, folks can just catch just some closing thoughts. I just like to say that um, I want everybody to know that the campaign hasn't ended. We are still meeting regularly and we're forming committees to make sure that HALT is fully implemented. So if you wanna get in on one of the best campaigns ever, join us. Others? I guess we're going in order, so I'll just make this really quickly. So thank you once again, Johnny. It's good to see you and all the rest of my colleagues and comrades. And, um, you know, just as Claire said, you know, and I found out through multiple campaigns and involved me that when it's over, it's just beginning. So in terms of what we are faced with, and Scott mentioned the implementation period between now and then, we got a lot of work to do. We're going to have more work to do as we get closer to the actual implementation period. So your fight is really never over when you think it's over. That's when it's really just beginning. And we uh, appreciate each and every one of you that have helped us get here, this victory, and that continue to stand by and support us. And as Jerome and Melania and the rest of my colleagues, get involved, get engaged, show support. You know what I'm saying? They need us. We are the voice for the voiceless. And we need to be able to let them know that people out here care and we let them lead to let the system know that we are not gonna stand or sit idly by while they continue to torture and mistreat our fellow human beings behind these walls. Thank you, Victor.
Uh, just three things I think to say. First is just thank you, Johnny, to everybody on the panel, to Meerkat, to Unlock the Box, to all the campaigns who are doing this work to end solitary all across the country. We need to be as collaborative together as possible to end this practice nationwide. Um, and on that front, just to note, if people hadn't seen just this week, there was a new federal blueprint to end solitary confinement. So I hope people can check that out. Maybe we can drop a, a link in the chat about that to take a look. The second thing is just to say, we've talked a lot about solitary today, but I know that all of us, and Victor, you mentioned it, you know, view solitary as just one piece of this entire racist and horrific system of incarceration that is destroying people and families and communities and needs to be dismantled. And so, you know, I encourage everybody to work collaboratively with everybody else who's trying to take on various pieces of this system, whether it's parole or sentencing or brutality or whatnot, we all have to work together to dismantle this entire thing. And then the third piece is, if you wanna come join us, we're gonna be celebrating the tremendous victory of Halt Solitary Confinement Act uh, three different times in Buffalo, New York City, and Albany. I'm gonna put a link in the chat of where you can um, see a flyer and see how to sign up to join us on those celebrations. Cause we need to, this was a monumental victory that people spent years and years fighting for led by people who've been inside and had or lost family members inside. So we need to celebrate these victories when we can get them. So hope to see you all there. Um, I just wanna say before we go, um, thank you to everyone that, that showed up today. It's very important for us to show up um, for one another. And I just wanna, you know, for those that don't, don't um, do that, the activism work and, because they're scared and they don't know where to start from. Look, look at me. Um, I didn't know where I, what I was doing. I mean, I, I still don't. I came into whole, um, solitary and, and, and it helped me shape, you know, from where I was at before. So just join. And, and as we are a team, so we are here for one another. And, you know, I'm blessed that I found this team because through this team, I was able to be myself. I was able, I had my most moments where I had, you know, I talk and I, I express myself the way I express myself. And not only that, just this team has helped shape me like a lot more, you know, even with the writing or we are a team. So don't be afraid, join us and, 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 and you'll become, you know, the best you can be, but just join us don't be afraid don't let the oh I don't know what to say or I don't know what to do or no it's, it's it takes work you, you know I'm still learning I'm not I'm not the greatest I still have a lot of work to, to, to do and I have a lot of learning um that I you know a lot of things that I need to learn but you know we are a team and we're here for one another so don't be afraid um join us join other like Scott said said there's other things going on for parole there's it's a lot of other reforms. It's a, the system is completely broken. It does not love us. And we need to, it's up to us to do the work. So don't be afraid. Don't, don't let you not be in, you know, never don't, I'm sorry, let me catch my thoughts. Don't um, think the way I used to think, well, I've never done this work before. How, where do I start? I'm scared to start. Don't let me be your example. Don't wait until your loved one goes through it. Don't wait until you lose someone that you really love to join. Join now because you never know what you could stop before you even lose a loved one. You know, uh, just we are here. And, and again, thank you everyone. And I am proud to be part of this team. And, and if you guys join us, you won't regret it. Thanks. Thanks.